All right, hello everybody. Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's Grasp on Robotics talk series. I'm Cynthia Sung. I'm an assistant professor in mechanical engineering and it's my great pleasure today to introduce our wonderful speaker. So before we get to that, as a couple of logistics, um, as a quick reminder, for those of you who are joining us over Zoom, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so you can insert your questions there. Um, we have two wonderful panelists today. Uh, Jessica Weekly is a fifth-year PhD student in mechanical engineering, who is in my group, and Shavag Kevanian is a first-year MEME PhD student, uh, co-advised by Nadia Figueroa and Michelle Johnson, and they will be helping us to monitor the chat um, and to manage questions both through the webinar and in person at the end of the talk. So feel free to raise your hand if you're here or put your questions in online. If you are going to miss any part of this talk or are interested in seeing future talks, all of our, or, or previous talks that you missed, um, all of our talks are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel and on our website. So feel free to check those out. And with that, um, I'm excited to introduce our speaker, Professor Jeremy Brown. Professor Jeremy Brown is a is the John C. Malone Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Johns Hopkins. He is actually an alum of the GRASP lab, was here previously as a postdoc in Catherine Kuchenbecker's group, before that did his PhD in Mechanical Engineering at the University of Michigan. He's done a lot of really interesting work in haptics and surgical robotics that he's going to be sharing with us today. And for this work, he's received a lot of awards, including the NSF Career, the Sloan Fellowship, and NSF CRII a grant, and many more. So please join me in welcoming Jeremy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. Can you all hear me okay? I think the mic is on. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you again, Cynthia, for the introduction and, and for inviting me here. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the work that we've been doing in my lab, the uh, Haptics and Medical Robotics Laboratory uh, at Johns Hopkins um, uh, for the last couple of years. I realize that it has been quite a while since I've actually been back to Penn uh, in this auditorium. Um, in fact, I dug up an old image uh, from my first time here. Uh, this is actually, I think, the first day I started my postdoc uh, back in like 2014. Uh, I was so excited because I got actually a chance to like bike to work. Um, we used to live right over in uh, the Grad Hospital area, um, and I uh, bought a bike specifically because I was coming to, I mean, coming to Penn and got a chance to, uh, you know, commute um, th that way. Um, was really excited about it. So, in any case. Um, it's been a while, um, but I'm happy to be back. Um, you know, I miss this place. I miss the buildings. I still remember somewhere uh, how to get myself around, although a lot has changed. Um, so in any case, before I get, you know, go any further, I do want to acknowledge um, that all the work that I have the privilege of talking about today, um, you know, is the product of all the students who've been in my lab, either past uh, or present right now. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge their hard work and effort that I sort of have the pleasure of being able to talk about. I think it was Dan who said this, or it may have been Costas. I can't remember. When I was a when I was a postdoc here where they had this panel session on like for uh, for postdocs and, and PhD students about where do you want to go after you finish your degree? Do you want to go into industry? Do you want to go into academia? Um, and I'm pretty sure Dan, it was you that said, you know, if you go into academia, you have to realize that the most important thing that you do is produce students. Um, and I took that to heart. And I think that is actually probably the most fulfilling job part of my career um, uh, is seeing students and mentoring students and watch them go through the maturation process of becoming independent scientists. Okay. Um, so uh, a lot of my work sort of starts with this understanding that our hands in particular um, are used to enable dexterous manipulation. Um, and we use our hands uh, to do dex manip dexterous manipulation for a number of tasks um, that uh, can be related to, you know, sort of everyday activities of daily living, brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, uh, you know, it could be related to work, um, also could be related to pleasure. Um, and sort of what we do for fun. Um, you know, what's how we sort of, what enables this dexterous manipulation is, um, you know, we start with commands centrally in the brain uh, that send uh, signals that we uh, call efferent signals, you know, from the brain out to the periphery that cause the muscles to contract, the limbs to move. Um, at the same time, we've got a suite of sensors embedded in the limbs themselves that take uh, sort of in event uh, information from the environment back to our body. We refer to these as our afferent signals. 
Um, and that's actually what a focus of all my research is on is this afferent pathway, in particular, the haptic sensory uh, afferent pathway. Um, when we think about um, you know, what this uh, uh, information provides, it, it gives us information about things like the texture of objects, the weight of objects, the contour of objects, the shape of objects. Uh, and we use that information sort of in a closed loop control fashion to be able to manipulate uh, in, in, uh, our own body and our, um, the environment when we come in contact with it. Uh, this haptic information, information is extremely important, extremely useful. Um, and I've taken this example here of striking a match to sort of you know, drive this home. What I'm going to show you is a set of videos, very old. You might have already seen them. They come from the lab of Roland Johansson, um, who does a lot of work, uh, a lot of seminal work in neuroscience motor control. Uh, and what you're going to see in this first video is a participant taking a match out of a matchbox and striking it. Um, pretty straightforward. And then what happens uh, is they take uh, local anesthesia, apply it to the participant's fingertips to basically numb the cutaneous afferent information that you would have at the fingertip and ask the participant to do it again. Um, I'll save you the, the, the anesthetization video and just show you the performance. All right, painful to watch, right? Uh, you know, I, I think sort of two takeaways from this. Uh, the first is that, I mean, the, the difference in performance is night and day. Um, uh, the second thing is that they were still actually able to accomplish the task. Um, and that's largely because they did not take away vision, right? And they did not take away what we call proprioception, which is my ability to know where my body is at any given time, right? Um, our body has basically a bunch of joint encoders around it. Um, and you know where your body is. So I can close my eyes and touch my ears without having to see them. They didn't take those senses away, but all they took away was the local sort of uh, uh, tactile information that you would feel right at the fingertips. But just taking that information alone makes this task extremely difficult. Um, you know, in my world, this is sort of how we think about the world of telerobotics. Most telerobotics do not provide this haptic information, which I'll go into in a little bit. They do provide good vision. Um, and so you can see sort of having vision, having good proprioception, but not having this extra bit of haptic information really affects your ability to do fine motor dexterous tasks. Um, for those of you that don't work with humans and only work with robots, I think the same rules and principles sort of apply, right? Uh, robots that don't have adequate sensing, um, you know, and can't actually sense their interactions with the environment are not, uh, uh, you know, as robust or able to interact and move in the environment the way we think they would, unless the environment is very well defined. Um, and, and the parameters are very well known, right? And you can sort of use these feed forward approaches uh, to do control. But anytime we sort of need information in a feedback pathway, this haptic information or this sensory uh, information is extremely important. Um, you know, so how we get into telerobots is because there are a lot of situations where we can't directly manipulate the environment. Right, either because the environment is located at great distances from our body, poses hazards to our body, is on a different scale, or we've contrived access, like in the case of minimally invasive surgery, um, where we sort of say, you can't touch it directly, you have to touch it through an instrument. Um, in both of those, you know, there are also scenarios, I should say, where the body itself um, has changed and its shape and conformation is the, uh, uh, it is the case of an amputation. Um, and in both of those scenarios, what we need is basically an interface that takes our action that we want to impart on the environment and does it for us. Um, those original interfaces were called teleoperators. Um, uh, and the way they work in the original formation, the ones that were created by uh, um, Gertz uh, in the early 50s and 60s to be able to do manipulation of radioactive material, um, is they were all mechanical, kinematically redundant linkage systems, right? And so because of that sort of cable-driven linkage system, you had good one-to-one -one mapping between what we call the leader side, where the uh, operator sits, and the follower side, where the end effector is. Um, and and that cable system also allowed this really nice haptic reflection. So anything that happened in the environment side got passed through the cable linkage system and you could feel it uh, on the operator side. Um, so it has this inherent haptic feedback. 
Um, nowadays, though, we've moved away from these purely mechanical teleoperators for a number of reasons, right? You're sort of limited in distance, right? The longer these things get, the more mass and inertia you have to sort of, and friction you have to deal with. Um, and they just become really hard uh, to move around. And so we've sort of, you know, and, and Gertz himself did this sort of in his later work after creating these, you know, purely mechanical things, he started going to electromechanical actuation schemes or servo motor actuations. And so now we actually have a series of devices that we call telerobots, right? Um, that allow us to basically do the same principles of teleoperation at greater scale. Um, and also, you know, in, in terms of length scale, but size scale uh, and time scale as well. Um, in, in my lab, we like to think of a prosthesis as a telerobot um, because you're basically operating a distal limb, the fingertips here, from more of a proximal location on the body, often through uh, uh, you know, means of uh, uh, input like EMG or electromyography. Um, in either case, when we think about telerobots, right, um, because we've got really good ways of sort of inferring intent or allowing users to control the input to the device, and we've got great sensor suites on these devices, we can do really good one-to-one -one mapping between input and output, right? Uh, the DaVinci, uh, um, you know, is sort of an example of that, right? Really good mapping on the forward path. Um, because of all of this, you know, these sensors, or we know what's going on, or we can measure for most of the times what's going on between the robot and the environment. The problem is that an information oftentimes does not get passed back to the operator, at least not haptically. Um, if anything is passed back, it's visual. And that's generally the predominant means by which operators are actually able to manipulate uh, through a teleoperator, a telerobotic scheme. Um, and so what my lab focuses in on is how do we add these haptic interfaces back in, or how do we understand what is the right type of haptic information that we want to add back in to allow the operator to be able to close this loop and therefore do dexterous manipulation again. Um, so we sort of work on three, I call them model telerobotic systems, I should say maybe two model telerobotic systems in my lab, upper limb prostheses, uh, as well as minimally invasive surgical robots. And then um, we also do a lot of work in my lab on just kind of fundamental haptic perception, um, you know, sort of our, of our three main senses that we use to manipulate the, in the environment, you know, vision, audition, and haptics. Haptics is the one that we still understand the least. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. Haptics is the one you typically don't lose, right, unless it's the result of traumatic injury in some way. There is some age-related uh, decline in haptic sensation like one would see in vision and audition, but not to the same degree. Uh, and so, um, you know, also haptics is just a really hard sense to sort of stimulate. When you think about vision and audition, they are both very centralized um, and they rely on one type of sensor, right? You have two eyes that see everything that there is to see. You have two ears that hear everything that sort of can be heard within the, the auditory spectrum. With haptics, you basically have a suite of sensors um, and they're highly specialized, right? I have certain sensors called Pacini and corpuscles that tell me about vibration and their only job is to tell me about vibration. So every time you feel your cell phone ring, know that that is one sensor in your body right at the, um, uh, the, the dermis layer of the skin, basically saying something is vibrating, right? Um, and it has a certain frequency band. Um, I have certain sensors that tell me about stretch on the skin. Um, I have other sensors that tell me about localized pressure. And these sensors also are what we call fast adapting and slow adapting. So some respond to transients, some respond to steady state. Um, and so trying to stimulate this suite of sensors becomes a really technically challenging problem. Um, and so that so that's why we, you know, and we still don't fully understand how we take, let's say, information from the environment or, or, or and can turn that into our understanding of the physics of the world around us. Right. Uh, and so that's what my lab also works in that space as well. OK, so I'll start with the upper limb prosthetics work that we've been doing. Most of the work that you see here um, is a uh, is was done by my uh, former Ph.D. student and postdoc, Dr. Neha Thomas. Um, who's now at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, um, you know, um, um, full time. Um, so, you know, if you uh, were to suffer an amputation or if you were to have an amputation in the upper extremity today, you sort of have two choices in terms of the types of prosthesis that you'd be outfitted with. The first is called a body power device, very old technology, post-Civil War era. Um, and it basically operates like that uh, um, original teleoperator. There's a shoulder harness that you wear. There's a Bowden cable that connects the shoulder harness to a what we call a prehensor or a prosthetic hand. Oftentimes, it looks like a hook. Um, and that hand it has a spring that either holds it closed or holds it open. And by acting and pulling on the cable, you're basically acting against that spring to cause the prehensile action. 
Um, the other device is a myoelectric prosthesis, um, uses uh, electromyography, so getting the electrical uh, sort of signal from the muscles as they, as they fire, amplifying that and using that to drive a motorized prosthesis. Um, what's, you know, the, the benefit of uh, myoelectric devices is that you can get increased degrees of freedom now. You can control, you know, individual articulation of the fingers, wrist rotation, and things like that. What you lose is the haptic information. Um, so there's no haptic feedback in these myoelectric uh, prostheses like there is in the body power devices because you've got this inherent mechanical linkage between the input and the output. Um, so, you know, it has been shown, you know, in, in my lab, um, you know, when I was a, a grad student um, at Michigan um, as well, that when you add haptic information into a myoelectric prosthesis, you get performance benefit gains, right? People can do tasks that they wouldn't be able to do or do tasks better than they would be able to do without the haptic information. Um, so what, uh, uh, you know, what uh, Neha started to ask is, well, sort of at what cost does this increased task performance come with? Um, and so we begin to say, okay, now let's look at task performance. So if I give you an object and I want you to tell me, uh, let's say, how stiff this object is, right? You need this haptic information. You need to be able to have grip force information to know the stiffness of the object, right? Because stiffness is sort of force over displacement. Um, and so, uh, um, you know, if I give you, uh, let's say, three objects, of different stiffnesses and I say sort them, right? You're able to do this task much better when you have haptic information. But we begin to say now at what cognitive cost does this increased task performance come with? Uh, and so the work that you're seeing here, it was actually done in collaboration with my colleague, uh, Dr. Hassan Ayaz, who's actually a professor at, at Drexel University right uh, um, down the street, um, who does a lot of neuroimaging. And the particular type of neuroimaging that, we're gonna, that we were using is called functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which basically looks at the prefrontal cortex. Um, and due to principles of neurovascular coupling, when you, you know, sort of, uh, when more blood flows towards the prefrontal cortex, you get more oxygen flowing as well, um, sort of to maintain metabolic rates. Uh, and you can look at that and the amount of oxygen and deoxygenated uh, hemoglobin um, in the blood to basically say someone is thinking harder, or there's more cognitive effort or more cognitive load. Um, and the particular, let's say, computation or metric that we're using here is called neural efficiency. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with efficiencies, like things like cost of transport, like how much energy does it take to move a certain distance. Here, we're thinking neurally efficient in terms of how much energy mentally does it take for a given amount of task performance, right? Um, so we're looking at task performance over the computational cost or the computational load of achieving that performance, right? Very similar to how one might think about sort of computation from you know, a, a computer, right? What is the computational power over the energy consumption that it takes to be able to give you that computational power? So good neural efficiency here means really high task performance, really low cognitive effort. Bad neural efficiency in this case would be really low task performance, really high cognitive effort. So we had a very simple experiment. I sort of alluded to it, right? If I give you objects of different stiffnesses and you can see them in the top right half corner here, um, we had three sort of uh, silicon objects that uh, basically all we did was mix different ratios of Ecoflex, dragon skin, things like that. So it looks the same, but they actually are different stiffnesses when you touch them. Um, and the experiment was very simple. Um, we basically asked participants to squeeze, it's called a two alternative force choice paradigm. We give you two objects, right? Object one, object two. We ask you to squeeze them and then we ask you which of the two was stiffer. Very simple experiment, uh, sort of what we call a psychophysics or psychometric uh, experimental paradigm. Um, and we keep giving you a series of these objects over and over again. Um, and over time, what we get is your accuracy. How well can you sort of identify at any given point of the pair that we give you, which of the two uh, was the stiffest? And we ask participants to do that in three conditions. Um, a prosthesis, which you see in the middle left here, um, which is, um, you know, a mock prosthesis in the sense that we're mainly working with non-amputee able-bodied participants, which is why it has this nice little bulge at the end here, because that sort of person's fist is actually sitting in the socket. Um, on top of the prosthesis, we have a little piezo-resistive force sensor so we can measure grip force. Um, and then we take that grip force information and we map it to a, which is sort of shown in this blue strap here, a C2 uh, viral tactile actuator. So we're taking grip force and we're turning that into a amplitude modulated vibration cue. So the harder you squeeze or the larger the force that we measure, the larger the amplitude of the vibration um, that they feel. 
Um, and so we had them do it with haptic feedback. So with this vibration information and then without haptic feedback, so without the haptic information. And then sort of as a, as a sort, of, sort of sanity check, we asked them to do the same task with their intact limbs. Um, uh, so their natural hand, because we wanted to say, you know, again, it's been shown haptics does better. But how does this compare to sort of the gold standard, which is what everyone in the prosthesis world is sort of searching or moving, trying to get to is like getting back to what the natural limb is capable of doing. So three conditions, prosthesis with and without feedback, and then the natural limb all doing the same task, which is basically a stiffness discrimination experiment. And you can see here in the top left, the little F near sensor uh, that goes across the forehead. Uh, it's an optical based imaging technique. Um, and um, you know, it goes right across the forehead and measures the level of oxygenated, deoxygenated hemoglobin. Question. They're not blindfolded, no. So what happens here, um, great question. Um, we put the object right here through this little window and they put their hand there and they can actually see themselves squeeze it. We do cover it with a little black sheath just because as best as possible, I mean, there's still some little imperfections that would sort of could give away clues, right? When we take it out the mold, maybe had a little chip on the side. And if every time all you notice is the chip that becomes a confounding factor and you're not actually looking at stiffness, you're just looking for the visual cue that sort of gives away which of the objects is different. Right. Um, so, yes, they can see actually what's happening um, as they squeeze the object. So we're not taking vision away in this context. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Great question. So this is all EMG control. So they are controlling the aperture. We basically take EMG, map that to velocity of the um, actuator, which basically this is a this is a um, it's sort of a it's a body powered style device because we've got a Bowden cable here. What you can't see um, is it, that Bowden cable is actually connected to a linear actuator. So we take their EMG, we map it to a linear actuator that pulls on the cable like the shoulder harness would pull in the body power case, but we've sort of rigged it up in the EMG fashion. So they have direct control over the aperture of the prosthesis. Yeah, so they're controlling displacement, what they're getting back and the haptic feedback is force. So ideally they should be able to get stiffness information out if you know the displacement and you measure the force or you feel the force through the vibration. Great questions. Um, so what we found, um, again, I, I remind you that we sort of use the standard Ecoflex stiffness uh, um, that was available to us. Turns out they're not, you know, they're not spaced, you know, sort of equally apart. We had three objects, we called them soft, medium, hard. Um, some of them are actually closer in stiffness than the other. And that's why we got this sort of trimodal distribution in our results, uh, because some of the pairs were harder to, to distinguish than others. So I'm gonna focus in on the one that was the hardest to distinguish, and that was the soft medium. That's what SM stands for. Um, you got a soft object, you got the medium object. Those are the two that were actually closest together in terms of their stiffness. And so what we see basically um, is that if you start, if you go from the left to the right, the left solid blue line here is the natural limb, right? So they're doing it with their hand and it's sort of what we expect, right? The hand is perfect. Every time you get the soft and the medium, you're able to distinguish the two. Um, and so no errors really in terms of being able to do it with your natural hand. Um, I'll jump the middle one and go to the yellow polka dot here. This is the case where we don't have any haptic uh, feedback. So they're using the prosthesis to do the task. Um, no information about force. They do, again, maybe have a little bit of visual cues, but basically we find that it's around the guessing rate, right? It's a two alternative force choice task. So you've got a 50-50 shot of getting it right. And by and large, we find that they are about 50% accurate. They're, they're generally guessing which of the two is the stiffer maybe with some informed guessing because of some of the like incidental visual cues that may be available, right? We also didn't mask auditory cues either, right? So you could hear the motor moving back and forth. We sort of wanted to mimic what a, you know, sort of real life uh, prosthesis scenario is. And we know that amputees or prosthesis wearers use visual and auditory cues all the time to sort of supplant the lack of haptic information. We didn't want to mask that. Um, so around guessing is what, is what we found. But when we add the haptic information back in, which is this like maroon wavy chevron pattern, we see that they actually get better, significantly better than the case without haptic information, still significantly worse than the natural limb, right? So we're not getting, you know, we're not as good as the natural limb yet, right? Still some errors, um, but significantly better than the no haptic condition. This result by itself, again, not novel. Others have shown similar results in similar tasks. Haptics does better when it comes to task performance. So then we said, okay, now what is the computational cost? 
Um, and that's what you see right here. And I'll, again, I'll focus just on the soft medium combination. And what you're looking at is the delta. So we take a baseline measure of mental activity before they did the task. And then we took a, a measure after they sort of made their guess, right? So we wanted to see what was the change in mental activity between the time that we said go and the time that they said, this is the stiffer object. Um, and what we basically found um, is that in the natural limb, again, solid blue here, that uh, um, the, you know, sort of the delta is basically zero, right? There's no cognitive load to sort of do this task. So you get perfect accuracy with the natural limb and basically no change in cognitive load, right? Um, makes a lot of sense. We use our hands all the time. We do stiffness discrimination throughout the entire day, right? Just based on our priors, we're really good at tasks like this. When you don't have the haptic information, again, the yellow polka dot here, um, you, very, you get a very large delta, right? Um, and so this sort of goes to this argument that we think they are trying to guess, right? They're trying to take these incidental visual cues, incidental auditory cues, and try as best as possible to piece together this storyline around which one they think is harder, right? If they just randomly guessed and did not care about the task, I would sort of expect their cognitive load effort to actually be pretty low, right? Because they're not actually putting any thought into it, but they are putting thought into it. And what, you know, and so what we remember is that they're getting about 50% of the time they're getting it right, and it's taking a lot of mental effort to get it at 50%. When you add the haptic information back in around force, we get a significant drop off in that cognitive load, that delta. Still nowhere near as good as the natural limb, but significantly better than the case without uh, the, um, the haptic feedback. And so sort of the takeaway storyline from this is when you look at cognitive effort, um, what you find is that our neural efficiency, um, what you find is that the intact limb, solid blue, the natural hand, is the most neural efficient, right? You get really good task performance with low cognitive, you know, sort of cost. Um, the, uh, um, the prosthesis without feedback is the most neurally inefficient, right? Not really great task performance, really bad cognitive effort. And the reason it goes below zero here uh, is basically because what we're doing, the calculation for a neural efficiency is basically taking the Z-score of your task performance minus the Z-score of your cognitive effort metric. And in this case, the cognitive effort metric is so large compared to the minimal gain in task performance that you actually get, you know, sort of negative efficiency here. Um, it, you know, sort of the gain are really bad for the amount of mental effort that it actually takes to do the task. When you add the haptic information back in, you start to get this positive efficiency again, much better than the case without haptic information, still significantly worse than the natural limb, but we're heading in the right direction. Something about this haptic information is allowing us to do really good task performance and is sort of allowing us to do it without the overhead of computational cost that it would take to do it without. Um, and then this, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, experiment sort of shows us that uh, um, the, uh, uh, you know, sort of it is it has been thought for a while that we don't know what the benefit of haptics is, right? We only think that it's going to give us a performance gain, right? Um, and, and sort of having this extra haptic information is going to come at the cost of computational power, right? Because now you've got another cue to attune to. It's maybe breaking up your concentration, right? If I'm standing here and talking to you and somebody texts me on my phone, like I'm going to lose my train of thought, right? And I'm going to think about my phone and I'm like, oh, where was I, right? So we, we there's, you know, sort of open theories that like this added haptic information actually actually doesn't decrease computational power, it actually increases it because you now have to attend to two different things. What we're basically finding is that at least in this scenario, the haptic information does lower the cognitive effort, right? Participants are already searching for this added information. They were doing it visually and, uh, and through audition. We're sort of allowing them to do it at a better, a better by, through a better means now by giving it to them haptically. Dan. That's a good question, right? So, um, you know, Dan's question, if we had the FNIRs tuned to different anatomical features, or maybe we were looking in different parts of the brain, right? Um, I would imagine that like, if we're looking, you know, so, and, and this is actually an interesting experiment to think about, right? So maybe if we weren't using FNIRs here, but maybe using EEG, and we're sort of looking at what parts of the brain would light up, I would expect we would see different parts of the brain light up in different, in these different conditions, right? I would expect a lot more activity in the visual cortex when we don't have the haptic information information because you're attuned to all of the video you're, you're trying to take in all of the visual information that you can parse through it and try to make sense of it whereas if you have the haptic information 
I would actually expect the somatosensory cortex to start lighting up a little bit more now because you've got this added information in the haptic channel, um, you know, compared to the case when you don't. Um, and I think, yeah, and, and so sort of some of the open questions that we have here now, like what is going on in the brain? Um, uh, and, and can we sort of think about that as we begin to think about what are the right ways to give this haptic information? I saw a question here and then I'll come to you, Cynthia, sorry. Um, I've been shooting a lot of and is the EC yeah, so so that's a great question, right? I, I'll re, you know remind everyone these are not uh, normal. You know these these participants are able-bodied individuals. You know do not have limb difference, do not wear and use a prosthesis throughout the day, and likely have not done EMG control. You know sort of for the better part of their lives, right? Um, we do take them through a pretty rigor not rigorous, but I would say a pretty in-depth training regime. Um, we also sort of what, what I don't show here is we typically run them through a a, a, a task where we measure their EMG control ability. Um, so we know you know sort of we map EMG to a little cursor on the screen and we do like a little sum of signs and sort of have them track this so we get an idea of what their EMG control ability is. But it is not, EMG is sort of a non-intuitive, right? Thinking, you know, this means close the hand, this means open the hand, right? It, it takes some getting used to. So I think there, you know, some of the higher cognitive effort that you see, I imagine some of it has to do with the novelty of the, of the experimental apparatus that we're putting them in. If we were to sort of test them day after day after day after day, I would expect in both cases performance to go up and uh, you know cognitive effort to go down. Right? You know, if we, if we invited a, a, a set of participants, and I'll show you an experiment where we're getting close to that of actual prosthesis users, I bet they would be able to do the task much better because they've gotten really good at attuning to these other incidental cues, right? You hear the motor start to bond on your prosthesis, right? You know about, you know, you can sort of use that cue to sort of figure out how stiff the object actually is or how much force the, the motor is actually exerting. And I would expect differences in performance in what we found here. So I agree, habituation actually is a big component that I'm not having, a, I don't have the data to actually talk about in this context. Yes. Yeah, that's another great question, right? Um, if I, let's say, took their vibration and I mapped it to something like, there's this device called the Rice Rocker, which basically uses skin stretch on the surface of the skin, or I mapped it to another, I mean, could be interesting, you know, another interesting question is, let's say I don't even map it to haptics, I put it, you know, I put it as a little like bar that goes up and down on the screen, right? Um, very interesting paradigm that I think would, um, sort of give us differences in cognitive effort. I think in the, so my theory is as long as we stay in the haptic domain, I would still expect to see lower cognitive effort than if we're doing something vision is very cognitively demanding, right? So anytime you're trying to get visual information, right, you're already increasing the visual effort just because of the vision is just a very cognitive uh, uh, sensory modality to begin with. I think there may be differences in uh, sort of the types of haptic information that we give and the way we give that haptic information. I'm not 100% sure. We could also think about auditory, right? Like, could I have just given them a pitch and turn, you know, tune the pitch up and down based on the feedback? Another great experimental paradigm. I think we had shown prior, and I'm not, I'm showing, not, not showing the work here, that when it comes to task performance, actually the mapping in terms of the haptic modality doesn't make a difference as long as you learn the mapping, right? So one of the earlier experiments that Neha did is she compared vibration feedback to this like exoskeleton that was giving force feedback because we thought force to force would actually be much more intuitive than sort of force to vibration. What we basically found out is that as long as you can sort of learn what the mapping is, you're still doing a mapping, right? Because it's not, like you said, it's not exactly the same thing as feeling it here at my fingertips, right? I'm taking that sensory referral information and saying, okay, this is a vibration. That vibration corresponds to this level of force or this amount of stretch corresponds to this level of force or even this amount of force corresponds to this amount of force. And that mapping in and of itself, I think people are really good at learning. But I think sort of once you learn it, I would expect that the cognitive load maybe would be about the same. But I don't have the data to sort of answer that question. That's just sort of me thinking out loud. Other questions? Okay, 
Um, so where are we going since where we where have been going since then? Um, we sort of started to get into more complicated tasks, right? So not just like can you squeeze an object and tell me how stiff it is, but can you do something that's more functional, like picking up an object, right? Uh, in particular, picking up an object that has unique properties. So what you're seeing here on the right right hand side um, is what we call our instrumented object. Um, it's modeled after some of the original work by uh, um, Flanagan and Johansson, where you had these objects that um, you could change the weight of the object without the participant knowing and sort of look at these grasping patterns. Because in a natural limb, what we find is that people, when they grasp an object like this bottle here, right? I am holding it just above sort of what is the normal force that's required to keep it from slipping, right? It's a very economical grasp. When you look at what amputee or prosthesis wearers do, it is non-economical at all, right? You are worried about uncertainty. And so you grasp it as hard as is physically possible. But what happens now if we put a penalty on over grasping? Um, and that's what you see here. So what happens happens is there's a wall on the object that is collapsible. If you squeeze too hard, you break it, sort of like picking up an egg. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this video here. And you'll maybe hear the click. Right. If you squeeze too hard, the object actually breaks. And so now what we're looking for is sort of this nice controlled force regime where if you don't grab it hard enough, right, you, the object slips. If you grab it too hard, the object actually breaks. Right. And then we start to get into a little bit more, you know, tight motor control paradigm. Um, the experiment that we did here was actually a little bit different because, you know, um, um, uh, Neha actually went and did a Fulbright fellowship with Catherine at Max Planck um, and really got into this idea around shared control and how do you do, you know, shared control for a prosthesis. And she came back with these ideas around how one could do shared control on a prosthesis. And what you're seeing here is one of our sort of ideas of shared control. This one is more of a mimicry style controller where basically you're training the prosthesis on the right way to pick the object up. And then you're letting the prosthesis sort of help you the next time you go pick it up. Um, and that's what you're seeing in this experiment, right? So you have to go grab the object, excuse me. And if you're successful, the prosthesis learns sort of what was the grasp force that allowed you to be successful, such that the next time you go grab the object, it sort of tries to replay that back for you. Still under your control, I can turn it on and off at will. When I go grab it and train it, I'm getting the same haptic information now about grip force. So you still have to learn what the right grip force is, but you don't have to do it you know, over and over again. And so we had an experiment where we said, okay, with this new style of like what we call haptic shared control, um, you know, are, do you get performance benefits in this case, um, you know, in terms of how many times you can successfully pick the object up and put it back down without it slipping and or breaking? Um, and that's what you're going to see here, but I'll, I'll just kind of go through this video just to make sure I'm getting through everything. Um, sorry, I'll back up. We're also still doing FNIR's imaging here because we want to look at neural efficiency again, so cognitive effort. What happens now when you offload part of the task to the, uh, um, you know, what happens when you offload part of the task to, let's say, an autonomous controller on the prosthesis as opposed to having it being completely under volitional control? Um, and so we want to know what happens in that context. Um, what I'm going to quickly show you in the in the charts here, sorry, um, the task again was how many times can you successfully pick the object up and put it down without it breaking or without it dropping. Um, the two charts that you're looking at, the one on the left here, is basically showing you what were the chances of you successfully lifting the object um, in the different conditions here. Again, we had a condition without haptic feedback. Um, a condition with just haptic feedback. So remember, just like the first experiment I showed, all we're doing is taking the force information and mapping it to a vibration. And then in the third condition, which you see is the haptic share control is the one that I talked about with the autonomous controller. So you've got this added benefit now that the autonomy will kick in once you start doing the task really well and start aiding you in doing the task sort of trial after trial after trial. And what we basically see is that in the haptic share control condition where you have this sort of human autonomy collaboration going on, you actually get better task performance out. Um, in terms of uh, sort of back to the change in uh, oxygenated hemoglobin or average uh, total hemoglobin, I should say, which is on the right hand side from the FNIR sensor, we find that um, you know, the haptic share control is heading towards, I would say, um, lower cognitive effort. This is maybe some of the ideas of what we were talking about early with habituation, not significantly different in this case, but we do get at least a trend that looks like we're heading towards lower cognitive effort. But when we when we take these and we sort of take these two things, remember uh, I talked about it earlier and compute the neural efficiency, which is the sort of 
difference between task performance and the difference between uh, the cognitive effort, what we find is that this haptic share controller is actually the most neurally efficient, right? You're able to do the task over and over and over again more times, and it takes lower cognitive effort. Um, and so we're starting to see that these haptic share control strategies, and this is some work that Neha started sort of the last year of her PhD, and we're trying to carry on now to see how can we advance these new types of control strategies where you've got sort of human volition combined with sort of an autonomous system that is trying to help you do the task. The question becomes, how does the autonomous system know how to help you? And this is some of the more interesting things that we're thinking about now, because if all I did was tell the system, I don't want things to slip, right? Then when I pick up this bottle here, it's a pretty simple task, right? If the object starts to slip, it squeezes it a little bit harder. But if I'm taking the prosthesis and I'm using it, to, let's say close a Ziploc bag, there the task constraints are completely different. I do want slip, right? I want to squeeze and slide along the length of the, the bag. And if the prosthesis says slip is bad now, right? It's going to squeeze as hard as it can and actually keep me from doing the task. And so how do we bring in a level of intelligence onto the prosthesis so that it knows things about the context of the task in which it's being used? And so those are sort of the, interest, the, the questions that we're beginning to ask now. Um, I'll just show just for, for the sake of argument that we have started moving towards working with actual prosthesis users. Um, here you're gonna see just a short video of the, uh, one participant that we worked with who came in and did the task with her clinically prescribed prosthesis. Remember trying to pick the object up without break, you know, pick it up without it slipping or breaking. Um, and what you'll see, and I'll just sort of give it away, um, is that every time she tried to do it with her, her clinical prosthesis, she failed. And you'll just hear it click and click and click. Right, and to remind you, clicking is bad. I mean, she's basically breaking the, the, the break threshold for the object. So if it were an egg, right, every time she grabbed it, the egg would, would, would crack open um, and you get yolk everywhere, right? Then sort of shortly after she did this, we had her try out our prosthesis, um, sort of same, uh, con you know, a little bit of a different EMG control paradigm for her. But remember, this is the one with the haptic share control on. You can actually see she's wearing the e well, you can't actually see the, e the vibration actuator is like right back here um, that's giving her the vibration information. And we asked her to do the task again, sort of without any real training other than sort of the new EMG control paradigm, which is maybe a little bit different. She was using pattern recognition on our, on our clinical prosthesis, and we're using more sort of agonist antagonist control for opening and closing the prosthesis. And what we find, at least in this sort of pilot situation, is a lot better performance. So you can see she's already holding it. And she grabs it, picks it up again um, without actually breaking it. Now, at the end, she does break it, which you can actually see. Um, you know, this is sort of an N equals one. Um, so I can't really tell you sort of, you know, conclusively that this thing is going to work. Um, but at least in this N equals one, now we're actually starting to get a little bit better performance uh, with an actual prosthesis user in terms of being able to do this fine control um, for these tasks that require, let's say, uh, you know, sort of uh, fine control forces. Okay, I'm gonna, um, the last thing I'll talk about in the prosthesis space is sort of think work that we've been doing in terms of hand design, right? So when we look at sort of the most state-of-the-art prosthetic limbs, the bivionic hand here, right, has the same shape, form, and function of the natural limb. The problem is the actuation scheme looks completely different, right? Um, there are individual motors sort of at the base of each digit that sort of control uh, actuation of the joint. If you look at how our hands work, right, we've got a series of tendons uh, that basically start, you know, in the forearm, run out, you know, uh, um, you know, to the limbs and separately control flexion and extension of the limbs. What's really nice about that is that not only can we control the endpoint position of the limbs, but if I decide to co-contract this side and this side, I actually make the limb really stiff, right? And we actually modulate the impedance or the stiffness of our limbs throughout the different types of tasks that we do. Um, and so current prosthesis designs don't really allow for this impedance modulation as you're doing task control. So I had a student um, you know, build sort of what is our first sort of working prototype of what we call an agonist antagonist or anthropomorphically driven prosthesis controller, where we've got separate tendons running to do flexion and extension using these little motors that are embedded at the back of the socket. Um, and what you'll see here is sort of just a, uh, you know, a working example of how this thing operates. <laughs> 
All right, and I'm gonna stop the video right here. So this is the box and box task, which is a standard task that people use sort of in the rehabilitation space, looking at like dexterity, things like that. And the reason I stopped this video is because what I wanted you to pay attention to, sorry, uh, is this little ridge here, right? So they just pick the object up, put it in the bin, and watch what happens now when they move their hand back across this ridge. Right, the, the prosthesis, if you caught it, went from a very high impedance state, right, of holding the object. And the minute they released it, it went into a very low impedance state and basically dragged the fingers over the ridge. Had this been a commercial prosthesis, they would have taken the whole thing with them, right? Uh, because you're not modulating the impedance of the limbs at the same time. So we think there's some um, merit to this type of uh, actuation scheme. And actually sort of what we're doing in the lab right now is sort of trying to combine the work looking at sh haptic share control with the work that we're thinking about with these novel anthropomorphic schemes to really say, okay, now how do we use the autonomy to control the, Im the impedance of the limb sort of while you're doing the task, right? To help you sort of achieve the task, uh, do the task better. Okay. I'm going to move from the work we've been doing in upper limb prosthetic space to talk about the work that we've been doing uh, in the uh, robotic minimally invasive surgery space. Um, and I'm just going to, I know I'm going to try to run, not run out of time. This is work done by my current PhD student, Sergio Mashaka, um, who's actually an alum of Drexel University. I should also mention Neha was an alum of Drexel University. Um, and uh, Guido Kashaniga, who is a visiting uh, master student in my lab, who's now actually at Max Planck doing his PhD. Um, so we know that the Da Vinci doesn't have happy feedback, it's quite known. Um, what we've been working on in our lab is sort of how do we deal with that, right? In particular, when it comes to learning how to do control of the Da Vinci, um, you know, without this haptic information, how do you learn sort of to understand the consequences of operating these instruments, let's say in a patient's body? We started off very, very sort of abstract here, taking inanimate tasks. This is actually work that I started with Catherine um, when I was here as a postdoc, um, where we can say, okay, let's put the task. In this case, this is task called peg transfer. You pick a peg up, you move it on the pegboard. Um, or excuse me, you pick an object up, you move it on the pegboard. Underneath that board, we've got a little force sensor, ATI Mini 40, that kind of measures all the interaction forces um, as you do the task. And we map that to this little wrist worn actuator that basically squeezes your wrist in proportion to the amount of force that you're generating, right? So giving you some sense of how much, ha how much uh, haptic information um, or how much force you're generating on the task. Um, this is what it looks like in operation for a different task. In this case, the task is called um, ring roller coaster. So you're taking a little elastic ring and you're moving it along this metal track. It's another standard task they use sort of in the surgical training space to build up psychomotor skills. Um, so we ran an experiment and we said, well, what happens now when I give you haptic feedback versus not giving you haptic feedback? So we ran a study with two groups, one that got the haptic information sort of all the time, one that did not get the haptic information at all. Um, and we asked them to do the same task, this little ring roller coaster task for 12 trials. What we were very interested in in this case, I should say, was what happens now in terms of task performance, but also the amount of time that it takes you to do the task. It's all the speed accuracy trade-off, right? Um, um, what does the speed accuracy trade-off look like for these participants when you have haptic information versus when you don't have haptic information? What we found is that, and remember uh, the task here is moving this little ring along the track. The idea is that you want the ring to stay in the center of the track so it doesn't make contact at all and doesn't drag. Anytime it makes contact and drag, you generate force. Um, and so we measure those forces and give them back through the wrist squeezing actuator. And what we found is basically that participants who got the haptic information basically produced lower forces throughout the entirety of the task. You're looking here at the uh, RMS of force sort of log transform just due to the distribution of the data. Um, but basically by and large for all 12 trials, when you have this haptic information, you produce less force on the task. Um, and then what happened, we said, okay, well, what does this mean in terms of how fast they do the task? And what we found is that the group that gets the haptic information, they start off a lot slower, right? Uh, they've got this extra information that they're trying to process and do something with, and it takes them a lot longer to sort of figure out, you know, sort of interpret the information and learn to do something with it. But over the course of the 12 trials, they actually get faster, um, so much so that they actually, when we looked at their rate of, let's say, uh, completion time, how fast they got faster, they actually did it at, significant, at a significantly faster rate than the group that did not, right? Um, so while they started off slower, um, by the end of just 12 trials, and each of these trials lasted a anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute. Um, so, you know, no more than about 15 minutes in, they'd already learned how to process this haptic information and use it sort of to their advantage. Because remember, they're also the same time as they're getting faster, they're not actually, you know, doing anything in terms of producing more force than the other group. 
Okay. Um, some of the other things that we've been doing in the, in the surgical robotic space is looking at how surgical training is done. Um, when you look sort of clinically, it's done two ways, either in the VR environment, right? They have a lot of VR trainers that help surgeons um, or on the actual robot itself. The robot itself is sort of considered the gold standard. Um, and we begin to ask the question, do th oops, are these two things the same, right? Is training in the VR environment the same thing as training in the real world? Right. I'm a mechanical engineer. I think there's something inherently interesting about the physics of touching things and, and coming into contact with things. So I sort of hypothesized that they may not be the same. And we ran this experiment where Guido um, came up with this task. It's a needle driving task. So you take a surgical needle and you drive it through these three rings. Um, and if you deviate from the ideal trajectory, right, we could measure that. He basically took like 3D space mouse, hacked them open and created these little sensors. They can tell deflection. Um, and we would map that to a little ring of LEDs that would visually tell you how the, uh, each of the little uh, rings was deforming. What was really cool is that he did this task by creating both a physical and a virtual analog. We have what's called the Da Vinci Research Kit uh, at Hopkins, which is an open source robot based off largely off the Da Vinci platform. So we can sort of create virtual environments. And so he basically, to size and scale, created a physical and virtual analog of the exact same task. And that's what you'll see in this video here. So same input, which you see in the middle, going to either the physical task on the right-hand side or the virtual task uh, on the left-hand side. And I apologize that the video on the right is not so great. This is the old Da Vinci endoscope, right? So this is the highest resolution that we can get out of the endoscope. Okay. So reasonable, we, we could argue we have sort of the same task in different environments. And what we did is we ran a study um, where we had two groups of participants um, that basically we took um, and we said, okay, you're going to be in the inanimate or the real environment. You're going to be in the VR environment. We took baseline measures and then we had them do a training session where they just did trial after trial after trial after trial. We did play around with the speed at which we asked them to do the task. And I'll tell you why in a second. So you had to do it slow. You had to do it at a medium pace. You had to do it at a very fast pace. We had them do about 40 repetitions of the trial. Then we said, okay, what happens now when we ask you to do the trial again after this training? Have you gotten any better from your baseline measure? And then the thing is, we said, what happens now if we ask you to do it in the opposite platform that you were doing before? So if you did everything in the inanimate real world task, we then put you in the VR task and ask you to do the task. Likewise, if you did everything in the VR environment, we then put you on the real task. And we said, what is the skill transfer between these two environments? The reason that I said we did this at three different speeds and the reason that you see the word sham here uh, is because in collaboration with some colleagues down in uh, at the School of Medicine and Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, we decided um, there's been evidence to show that non-invasive brain stimulation um, can be used to improve motor learning. Um, in particular, stimulating the cerebellum um, uh, can, be can be useful in sort of acquiring new motor tasks. Uh, and so we then had a group that was their brain simulation. We used transcranial direct current simulation um, at the cerebellum at the cerebellum to see if it gives us any performance benefits in either of these two cases. What we basically found, uh, again, we sort of have a, because we had different speeds, we sort of have a trimodal distribution. I'll sort of focus in on the moderate speed because this is the one that sort of reflects what your natural speed would be like in a real environment. Um, basically what we find, if you go from the red block to the, to the green block, right, what you see is that people get better, significantly better from baseline to training, um, uh, you know, uh, or baseline, excuse me, to evaluation. So after training, pre-training, post-training, they get significantly better uh, in both cases, both in the real world, the inanimate training, and in the virtual world on the right-hand side, right? So training does allow you to get better in the task. Then we said, what happens now when we switch tasks? And what you're looking at with the blue block is the transfer. And what we see is that in the inanimate world, which is this one right here, right? Their skill, uh, in this case, measured as an error in performance, um, lower is better in this case, doesn't change, right? They were able to take the skill that they acquired in the inanimate world, transfer it into the virtual world. We don't see that in the virtual case, right? Even though they get better, right? They go from baseline to evaluation, they get significantly better. When we put them in the physical world, they actually get significantly worse, right? Their errors go up. Uh, 
And so we begin to now think about why is that the case? What is it about the physical world that allows them to gain and retain skill better than they were able to do in the virtual world? Before you ask a question, I'm gonna show you what the effect of the stimulation was because this is where it gets even more interesting, right? When we only look at the, the virtual group, right? Um, uh, the virtual world, right? Doing the task in the virtual world. Again, I'll focus in on just the moderate speed. What you basically see is that this is the one that I already showed you, right? They go from baseline to evaluation, they get significantly better. And the minute we put them on the inanimate or the real world task, they get significantly worse. But when we stimulate, right? Again, looking at the cerebellum, we see that again, they go baseline to evaluation, they get significantly better, which we are used to. But when we ask them to move over into the physical world, they don't change. They were able to retain the skill and not get significantly worse in the, uh, when they were going on the inanimate world. Not even 100% sure why this is the case, right? Um, we're still sort of trying to tease apart the theory of this, but the idea is that the cerebellum really helps with feed forward types of motions, ballistic motions. And that's sort of what we were asking them to do, right? Um, you know, you're doing this task largely before the visual feedback, and there's no haptic feedback in this case, sort of allows you to process exactly what you're doing. And so we think what's happening when you do the simulation is they come up with a good feed forward plan and can continually execute that feed forward plan because all we're doing in the simulation uh, sense is just basically stimulating the brain to be more sensitive or hyperactive at the time that they're doing the training. And we only did the simulation during training, I should say. I forgot to clarify that. So they're not being stimulated in baseline evaluation or the transfer. Okay, um, still a lot of open questions as to why this is the case and where do we go from here, but an interesting finding. All right, the last thing I'm gonna show, and this is sort of getting into some funny stuff that we started getting to is my student Mohi, who's now a, uh, um, a fellow at the Stanford Biodesign program, um, was doing sort of finishing up his PhD. Um, so we know that, uh, um, you know, sort of the ideal teleoperators are what we call, see that, are, are what we call, you know, we want them to be transparent, right? If I'm operating, I shouldn't feel the dynamics of the robot. All I want to feel is the environment. It, goes, it gets out of the way. The reality is that, is that all telerobots are not transparent. In fact, they're not transparent at all. They actually add dynamics. Anytime you close a PD loop, you add virtual stiffness, virtual damping into your controller, and you can actually feel it. So we begin to ask, what is the cost of this non-transparent teleoperation? Mohit built this sort of rig here that we call our teleoperation test bed, where basically we've got different types of transmissions between the input on this side, the output on this side. We've got a rigid rod, sort of like that original GERT style teleoperator. We've got two electrical motors that we can close a PD control loop. And then just for like fun, we said, let's actually add physical dampening through a rotary damper here and physical stiffness. We just put a little torsional element in the middle. And we said, what happens now when we ask you to do a task through these three different teleoperation schemes? Um, this is just another picture of what it looks like. Um, you know, these are just sort of, we, you know, did some system ID on the, on the uh, devices just to show you that they are inherently different dynamical systems. They have different closed loop dynamics to them um, in terms of input output behavior. Um, and we asked them to do a task, which is basically object tracking. I put a little marker on the screen and I have it move at some periodic function, likely a sign or some sum of signs. And I asked you to track it with your input. Um, as you can see, participants were able to do it in all different configurations of this teleoperator fairly well. So much so that when we looked at their error over time, right, we found that there were no differences. So even though they've got different dynamics between the input and output of the robot, right, when it comes to tracking the environment, somehow they're able to come up with what we think uh, is that they're somehow able to come up with a model of the plant dynamics and invert those dynamics so that they can then do good tracking behavior uh, on the output of the device, which is something that we were just not expecting to begin with at all. Um, and we can sort of see evidence of this and what we look at on the right hand graph is what we call our tracking adjustments. So how much did they actually change what they were doing on the input and output in order to get the perfect tracking or the good tracking performance behavior? And what we see is that in fact, they are doing different things, right? They know that the system has lag in it. And so they start to compensate uh, for that by putting a little bit of lead into it, right? And so um, they're actually, we know that they're somehow learning the dynamics of the system and coming up with ways to compensate for those dynamics, which is kind of interesting. Interesting. All right, this is just looking at the force. We had a force sensor on it, um, and it sort of shows that they do different things as well. Okay, last thing I'll show you, and this is sort of the, the fun takeaway, and I know I'm right at time or over time. This is called the mirror illusion, right? Basically, I put a mirror in front of you. I have you look in the mirror, and I have you simultaneously tap your fingers, 
if I start with your hands far apart and I have you look in the mirror, so let's imagine the mirror is here and I have this hand over here. As you start to tap, this phenomenon called proprioceptive drift occurs where you begin to think about your hand actually spatially equidistance across the mirror, even though physically it's over here. The visual information is creating a conflict with your proprioceptive information and you're beginning to trust vision more, right? So you say, I know my, I mean, technically my sensors are telling me my hand is here. Visually though, I see my hand here. I think my hand is actually more here. It's a phenomenon. You know, a lot of papers have looked at this proprioceptive drift. This is another illusion called the, oops, sorry, called the rubber hand illusion, where if I simultaneously stroke your hand and another hand and it that happens to be rubber in front of you, as long as you can't see your hand and you think this rubber hand anatomically looks like it's in the right position as your hand, you begin to think about that hand as being part of your body. Um, you can go look at YouTube videos. They like people take it to the extreme. They'll like do the stroking and it has to be the simultaneous stroking. They'll take a knife out, right? And people jump back, you know, with their thinking that their real hand is about to get stabbed. Um, another sort of recorded phenomena in the literature. We begin to say, what happens now if I take the synchronous brush strokes from the, uh, the rubber hand illusion, right? Which allows me to embody the rubber hand, put a mirror in between it. Does it allow me now to, to embody the reflected hand and actually come up with this idea of artificial brush strokes? So feeling brush strokes that actually aren't present. Okay, um, this is what our setup looks like. I'll just sort of run through it really quickly. Basically, we have two little servos that have brushes on them that come in and stroke the length of your finger over time. And we can control when they come in in contact and how they stroke. And that's what you'll see here. And you'll hear the participant. We have three conditions that you'll hear. That's the case where the one on this side, the left-hand side doesn't do anything, then it taps, and then it actually strokes. Stroke. OK. So what we did is we had this nothing case, this tap case, the stroke case. Nothing means the motor on the left doesn't do anything. Tap means it just brings the brush in contact and taps the base of the finger and lets it go. Stroke means it comes in contact and it strokes along the length of the finger. The right fan, hand is always doing the exact same thing. It's just stroking the entire time. And so we asked participants to do it. Again, I'll show you here. So you have to tell me what you feel on your left hand, either nothing, so this is what's happening. a stroke, the left or a tap. The right hand is doing the same thing over and over again. Nothing. She's saying nothing. Tap. She's saying tap. Stroke. And now she's saying stroke, right? Sort of makes sense, right? Nothing, tap, stroke. Then we uncovered the mirror in between. So they're looking here at the reflection of this hand, um, which is equal distance from this hand actually over here. And we do the exact same experiment. Same instructions again. She said nothing. She said a light stroke. A light stroke. A light stroke. And this goes on and on and on, right? We're never stroking the finger, we're only tapping it, right? Um, but we've created this visual haptic conflict and the way that she resolves it is by saying it's not a full stroke, it's a light stroke, right? Um, and so then we begin to, we sort of quantified this by coming up with a measure that's sort of like the proprioceptive drift, where we basically said, tell us the furthest distance along the length of your finger where you felt something. Um, and what you see is that in the case where we have the mirror covered, which is called baseline right here, everybody basically says, I felt, the, I felt the brush at the base of my finger, right? Every single time the mirror is covered, everybody says it's touching right here. The minute that we uncover the mirror and we ask you to tell us the distance along the length of your finger where you felt the brush, we get something that is much greater, significantly greater uh, for all of our participants than what we found in the baseline condition. Right. Um, so something I can tell you, as someone who knows what the illusion is. Right. And having sat down at the table, it is one that even though, you know, you're being fooled, you cannot deny that something about seeing the brush stroke in the mirror and getting this sort of what we call a haptic confirmation of at least something touching you. You feel this sort of brushing effect along the length of your finger, even though physically, you know, it's not actually brushing. you. Um, and I've tried, I've sat at this thing while Mohit was doing it. And I've been like, you know, I, for a while I was like, okay, well tell me when you actually turn on the illusion. He's like, oh, the illusion has been going, right? Um, you know, it is a strong illusion. And, and, and so I don't know where we, you know, sort of ideas that we have about this is that what it's kind of telling us is that if I can create a convincing enough visual uh, uh, cue for you, 
and give you a little bit of a haptic confirmation. It doesn't be the, have to be the actual haptic thing that you would normally feel. It's just enough to convince you that what you're seeing in the visual world actually exists. Very similar to how people do the like targeted redirected walking, right? Where I can put on a VR headset and have you follow a wall that's actually curved, but because I show you it's straight, you think it's a straight wall, right? Um, the same thing sort of exists in this space as well. We're sort of making you sort of deny what you haptically wanna feel because the vision is telling you something that feels so salient. Okay, with that, I will stop. I know I'm over time, I apologize. Um, and I will sort of take whatever questions uh, you have. So thank you. Our, our tactile sensing is actually not as high in spatial resolution or in perhaps the resolution of being able to feel uh, the stroke versus the tap, et cetera. And so we're actually, when we are observing these things that we are always utilizing other modalities like vision to kind of complement these, you know, uh, suboptimal tactile, tactile feedback that we're getting. And that's how we actually feel these things even normally, let's say even outside of your experiment. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, this idea of visual dominance is something that we, you know, sort of all know, right. We tend to be visually dominant, right. Some people would maybe argue that no, we, it depends on the task, right. But by and large, we operate in the world with visual when you have visual information available and we sort of use the haptic information to sort of help us with things that aren't visually present all the time. Right. Um, you know, I look at this object over this water bottle, right and I know what it is and I have an idea about how much water is in it but it's not until I actually go pick it up that I actually know about you know how much water is in it and I, the minute I feel that I sort of change my control plan right if my if my if my pre-planned model was incorrect to sort of adapt right um so we think the same thing is happening um and you know we're not the first to show this right the, the famous like Ernst and Banks work where you have like visual haptic conflict shows that when you sort of give you mismatched information you sort of have to resolve it in some way right and so sometimes you just either ignore the haptic information altogether and trust the vision what we found in this case is that when it's you know when we didn't do the tap right um and we just showed the the uh visual stroke they still said nothing Right. So even though vision was telling them stroke, right, haptic was saying, I am not being touched at all right now. They were OK with that. And they knew, OK, this is a conflict like I'm trusting my haptic information. But the minute we gave them something that was maybe somewhat congruent with what they were seeing, it created enough conflict that what we think ends up happening is when you have these conflicts, you just want to make sense of the world. And the best way you can make sense of the world is to say, this is not the same thing as the full stroke condition. This is another condition that we call the light stroke condition, right? Uh, and, and it happens so much so that what we did, what we did, and I'm not even, I didn't show you the data, is we sort of, we sort of, um, we said, how long does this effect last, right? So if anybody's ever gone, let's say skiing or roller skating, you know, the minute you get out of your skis and out of your roller skates, you have this like weird sensation, like you're still sort of gliding across the floor, right? Um, you're sort of, your gait has sort of like adapted to this new motor control paradigm that you sort of still feel like you're kind of skating. And we said, does that illusion still happen? And so what we did after we did the illusion is we turned it off and then asked them, we sort of primed it again, turned it off and said, what do you feel? And what we found is that we got this decaying effect where they initially said you know, you know um, they picked some distance that was indicating that they were in the illusion and over time it started to drift back to the point where again this is mirror covered um where they say no i'm not being touched you know there i'm not being touched at all right now um so you know this is totally a cognitive phenomenon right uh um uh but it sort of shows that like when you give, you know, sort of incongruent information in your sensory channels, right, you sort of have a choice to make. You either trust one piece of information over the other, or you try to blend the two pieces of information together to sort of create the best, the thing that makes the most sense. And what we found in this case is that people, by and large, were doing the middle option. They were blending it together and trying to come up with something that made the most sense. The physical world has to be doing something different now to sort of align with what I'm seeing and feeling. Oh, I have a question. Um, in human beings, uh, the actuators and the sensors for haptic is in the same place, right? Sometimes, for some of them, uh, not all of them, but keep going with your question. 
um, is is it what happens with the um, Da Vinci robot? That the actuators and sensors are in the same place uh, on the hand or on the robot? Sorry. On the hand. On the hand. So it all depends. So, I, and I didn't really deep dive deep into this, right? So you've got a series of sensors that we call like cutaneous afferents that are embedded in the skin. Everywhere you have skin, you have these sensors. They're just in different densities. You've also got sensors embedded in the musculoskeletal system that give us information. So you've got these organs called Golgi tendons um, and the muscle spindles, which are actually embedded in the muscles themselves that act like encoders. They tell you how the muscle is stretching. And you've got Golgi tendons, which sit between the tendon and the bone. They basically act like strain gauges to tell you how much load is being applied to the muscle. Um, so when you grab, let's say an object, right? And you squeeze it really hard, Part of the information you're getting right at the fingertips, but the other part of the information you're getting is actually back here. Um, but one could say it's co-located because the actuator is actually located back here, right? At the fingertip, the actuator is actually not here. It's just a tendon that runs up to here. The actuator is actually located uh, in the forearm. Um, so it's sort of a yes and no, um, but go with the, the question about the Da Vinci. I was thinking about um, people, about um, amputees uh, who still has one hand. Mm -hmm. Can not, can't we do what happens in um, in Da Vinci robots on the other hand? I mean, uh, uh, like a teleoperation between the hands. And uh, I mean, instead of mapping between force and vibration, um, their brain kind of maps between force to force. The yeah. way that they used to learn the haptic feedback in two years, I mean, so, so that's actually, that's a great question. And that's actually somewhat how the body power prosthesis works, right? So when you think about the body power prosthesis that has a shoulder harness, you're actually, it's not, you know, sort of this hand to this hand, but it's this part of the body, right? It's the shoulder motion that's controlling the opening and closing of the hand, such that when I grab something, right, I don't feel it here, I actually feel it as the resistance in the shoulder. Right. And that's a good example of how you can sort of do this referral of information where it's like force that you would normally feel here, you would actually feel here. We've thought and actually when I was a grad student, we played around with this idea of doing sort of this bilateral using the sort of intact limb to substitute for the missing information on the on the on the amputated side. It has its pros in that you're sort of using the intact system. Right. And you're sort of mapping, like you said, force to force. It sort of has its cons in terms of like functionality, right? Because if I'm doing a task where this hand wants to do one thing and this hand needs to do something else, I'm sort of getting two pieces of information for this hand that I'm trying to close the loop on, you know, even though action is still on this side of the body. Um, but I think, you know, sort of where I think the prosthetic, the prosthesis world is actually going, um, and there's a lot of work in this space, is actually looking by tapping directly into the nervous system, right? Um, you know, sort of what they call peripheral nerve interfaces. And they're also thinking about doing it in the brain. The problem that they're running into right now, by and large, is that we don't know how to send the information in a sort of naturalistic way. Like we can deliver spike trains, I can tap into the nerve and I can send spikes down the nerve and people will say, oh, it feels some, I feel something, but it sort of feels like a tingling or a buzzing. And so, you know, in my world, you know, sort of, I, I think the, the BCI community or the, the, the peripheral nerve interface community is sort of like, well, what do we do? Because it says it feels like a buzz. In my world, we're like, well, everything sort of feels like a buzz. Like we buzz you for just about anything. And, but buzzing is not a bad thing as long as you can sort of take that buzz, interpret it and do something with it, right? Like, you know, with my phone in my pocket, I know if I'm getting a text message, I know if I'm getting a call, I know if I'm getting an alert from my ring doorbell just based on how the buzz works, right? Um, you know, and we sort of have learn to encode this information sort of in a natural way um, and you know ascribe meaning to it. And I think the same thing is happening when you talk about these artificial sensations. We have, we haven't. It's a it's an open question. Um, so um, we have been sort of up until recently very limited by the sensing modalities that we have, right? Um, there's been sort of a revolution in sort of the sensing that is available now for like hands and things like that. A lot of it driven by the robotics community trying to you know build hands that can do manipulation and things like that. And we sort of have the advantage of now having 
better sensors at our disposal. Um, one of which is things like slip, right? Uh, slip is a big problem, right? So grip force only tells you how hard you're squeezing, but we know that like the, you know, and what's interesting about slip is that it's what I almost call a reflexive loop, right? If I'm grabbing an object and it starts to slip, I squeeze tighter before I even recognize that the object was actually slipping. Same thing like with, you know, you touch a hot stove, you jump back before the burning sensation actually reaches your brain. Um, what we've been thinking about sort of along those lines is can I start to offload some of this extrasensory processing to the system as opposed to having to always pass it to the brain and have the amputee close the loop, right? Because anytime you're asking the wearer to close the loop, especially when you're talking about a uh, sort of encoding of information, right? It has to go from the device to the site where you're sort of transmitting it, let's call it vibration. I then have to take that vibration information, encode it in the brain and decide what to do with it, which is very cognitive, and then come up with a response, sort of a, a response of action sort of in relation to that. And that loop rate is very slow, especially when you're talking about something like slip, right? By the time you process that the object is slipping, it's already out of your hands, right? So can we sort of solve that problem by relying on sort of good intelligence on a prosthesis to say, slip, oh, I know slip, I need to stop this thing from slipping. The problem comes in sort of with what I talked about before, slip may not always be a bad problem depending on the task, right? Uh, you know, if I'm winding up the cable, right, as I pack up, right, and I'm tying up my cable, I actually want slip, right? If I'm looping my cable around to tighten it up, I actually want local slip. So the problem is you can't just say like, for all cases of slip, do X. It needs to be, for all cases of slip in task Y, do Z. Right, and so we need to get processes that are more intelligent to know what is the task why that I'm doing, so that I know how to take the slip information in and do the appropriate uh, like responsive action. You offload that control. That's what we think. Now, in an ideal world, you wouldn't have to offload it, right? If you could perfectly tap into the periphery of the nerve nervous system, right, and give that information through the same channels that we naturally do with our natural limb, I don't think you would have to do this offloading. I mean, our bodies do this offloading all the time, right? I have high level processing and I have very low level processing. The problem is right now, I think what we, my thought is, leave the amputee or the wearer in the loop to let them do the high level volitional processing and offload some of the low level processing to the system. Okay, we're going to take the last question. Okay. Well, actually, I'll get yours after you. Yeah, you just sort of started answering the question I was going okay. to ask anyway, but I guess I'm curious about these scenarios where I guess I'm really interested in these these particular scenarios where you want like a prosthesis to give the user basically as much volitional control as you can and ultimately you would love for them to have very high dimensional volitional control. And so I'm worried I'm I'm curious if you've thought about sort of feedback of higher dimensional signals. Um, I, it seems like most of, I think, it seems like there's a lot of research to be done just looking at these sort of, you know, one, one dimensional vibration coming back or something like that. But I'm curious as you have, you, have you experimented with sort of, you know, multiple vibrations meaning different things, or I guess you said not, not so much simultaneous proprioceptive and tactile, but, but things in that space. Yeah. Um, I, 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 Maybe I, I thought I had a slide that I could show you. Yeah, so um, I didn't have a chance to show this uh, in, in the time, but we have, right? We started to play around a little bit with this idea that you've got both volitional loops and you've got reflexive loops. Um, and we, uh, Neha came up with this prosthesis that uh, basically has two types of information. So you have a finger that basically has uh, an, an electrode in it that tells you where you're making contact along the length of the finger. And we have another finger that has a force sensor on it that tells you how hard you're squeezing. And what she did is she mapped that information to uh, two different types of vibration, just like you imagined. And so you can see it sort of gets complicated here, right? Don't pay attention to this one, uh, but pay attention here, right? So we can tell where you're being touched along the length of the finger, how much grip force you're actually producing. And we use the same actuator, in this case, a vibrating C2 tactor to encode the information differently. And the way we had to do that is by modulating both the amplitude of the vibration, but also the frequency of the vibration. And then on top of that, we also put these things in these enveloping functions uh, to try and encode this information differently. So one piece of vibration would tell you how hard you're squeezing. The other piece of vibration would actually tell you where along the length of the finger you were being touched. And what we found actually in this case uh, is that participants were able to do this task pretty well, right? And so the task in this case was grabbing an object, picking it up, moving it, and putting it back down, called a reach the pick and place task. Um, and we basically found that when you have the vibration information, you actually do better 
um, in terms of doing the task better than when you only have, let's say, no haptic information. We also had, in this case, actually a reflexive controller that was just controlling slip. Um, so this is another form of the shared control now where you've got slip detection going on and you've also got uh, you know, haptic information that's encoding where you're being touched and how hard you're squeezing. I think there are gonna be limits though, right? You know, like trying to process, this is still an information processing challenge, right? And as long as we're using referral of haptic information, we're gonna reach sort of computational limits. If I'm giving you five things that are telling you five pieces of information, you know, sort of five orthogonal pieces of information, right? Um, it's gonna take you a while to process each sort of stream and figure out what to do with it. I think the more you do a task, the better off you get, right? You think about, you know, someone that plays like an instrument or something like that and their ability to coordinate information coming in. I think the brain can adapt. It's plastic enough where it could learn it. Will it get us exactly what the natural limb is doing? No, but will it get better than sort of these single streams of pieces of information? I think so. And can we then think about what is the most important information to give at any given time? Then we can sort of break the time, the problem down sort of temporally and say, I don't need to give you all five pieces of information at, the, at a time. I only need to give you this piece of information right now. And once you've achieved this part of the task, then I start giving you that piece of information. Once you've achieved that part of the task, then I give you this one. Oh, you slipped. Okay, I'm going to give you this information again because I know you need to go back and restart. And if we can think about sort of breaking a task down into what is the most important information that you need to achieve chas success at that given time, then we can begin to think about how we take this like high dimensional problem and break it down into sort of low dimensional sort of segments, uh, you know, along the way. All right, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, everyone, please help me in thanking uh, Dr. Jeremy Brown again. Thank you. If any of you do have more follow-up questions, uh, Professor Brown will be joining uh, students up uh, on the fourth floor Levine uh, Grass Lab for lunch. So feel free to join him there. There's pizza outside. Um, as an announcement, next Friday, our Grasp on Robotics uh, speaker will be Professor Jitendra Malik from UC Berkeley. If you want more information about that talk or any of the other parts of their series, uh, you can check out our website